Amen. Our scripture lesson today in unison is from 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13. Please join me. Elijah has fled from Jezebel after the defeat of the false prophets on Mount Carmel. He has run to Horeb at the Lord's insistence. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Good morning. Looks like it's just my kids today. That's okay. So, which means you have to participate, Teresa. Yes. So, can you tell me, look around, and do you see what kind of color everybody's wearing today? You're wearing red. Me too. Because today is a special day. Today is Pentecost, and we're wearing red to celebrate it, because today, we're remembering when God gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus, before he ascended to heaven, he told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. So now they had to wait, but it's hard to wait, especially if you don't know how long you have to wait. So it's like when we go to Great Adventure and you want to go on a ride and there's a long line and we have to wait. And sometimes it feels like forever. And you're waiting and you're waiting, but you wait because you know at the end of the wait, there's going to be something great. So the disciples waited because they were going to wait for a gift from God. Huh? Yeah, from God. So they were waiting and they were in a house. And this mighty wind came rushing in the house. house? Yeah. What, do you know what a mighty wind might sound like? No. No. Would it be like this? Yes. No, no. That's like a gentle breeze. We're talking a mighty wind, like <laughs> mighty wind filled the house. And then the, the next thing that happened was something a little crazy. Some fire appeared above their heads. Can you imagine that? If I had fire above my head? Now, it didn't burn, and it didn't hurt them but it gave them the most incredible power. It let the disciples speak in a different language. Now, do you speak a different language? No, no not yet, right? What about you? You're learning, right? So you ever go to a different place and the people don't speak your language? It's hard to understand. So once the disciples received the Holy Spirit, they were able to speak a different language. So at the time in Jerusalem, there was people from all over the world. You can get water in a second. Sit down. So the disciples were speaking in a different language. So when the people in the town from all over the world heard that mighty wind, they came rushing over to the house. And they were amazed because they could finally understand what the disciples were saying in their own languages. So before Jesus left, he gave the disciples a job to do. And before they got the Holy Spirit, they weren't able to do their job. I'll show you an example. So what's the job of this balloon? The balloon is supposed to like float up in the air, right? Is this going to float? No. No. Why? What's, what's wrong? It's missing something. What's it missing? I don't know. It's missing air, right? So what if we filled it with a little bit of air? Is it going to work now? No. No, that's not enough, right? So what about this balloon? What about this one? This one is filled. Is this one going to work? Yes, yeah, see? So the same thing with the disciples. So they're like this balloon that was empty. It's not going to work. 
until they got filled with the Holy Spirit. So once the Holy Spirit filled them, they were finally able to do their job. Okay, now, well, now that's full. So just like the balloon needs to be filled with air to work, the disciples needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit so they can go out and do their job. And do you know what their job was? Their job was to share the stories and the teachings of Jesus. So can you guys pray with me? Okay, say, dear God, thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let it fill us and help us share your love. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from John, the 20th chapter, the 19th through the 22nd verse. Hear the word of the Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Now, um, the sermon title is really a bit deceptive because uh, a kinder, gentler Pentecost isn't exactly accurate. It's really a kinder, gentler, no, it's a quieter, gentler coming of the Holy Spirit because this is not Pentecost. This is a different version of the coming of the Holy Spirit. The thing that um, I think we need to keep in mind is when we think about Pentecost, it's a particular historical event occurring at a particular point in time. And that's what the Acts account is about. And if I can just kind of switch into Bible study mode for a moment, these are two very different accounts in John and Acts. And they represent an issue that we sometimes have when we're reading and studying scripture. As I mentioned before, um, scripture is written, and I'm going to reference the Gospels, I think, to make it a little easier. Um, they were written to a particular audience, experiencing particular situations and circumstances at a particular point in time. And even though the Synoptic Gospels shared a common source, um, they still had a different perspective because they were writing to different audiences. Now, that doesn't mean that one account is preferable to the other or that there's necessarily a contradiction between the accounts. Again, it's a particular people that's being written to dealing with particular circumstances at a particular point in time. And that applies to the account in John and in Acts. We're gonna start with Acts. Of course, um, Kelly has already told us, in Acts 1, Jesus tells the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and throughout the earth. The disciples are going to wait, but they have a prior issue that they want Jesus to address, and that is, well, are you gonna restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? In their minds, they're associating Pentecost, or the coming of the Holy Spirit, with the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. Because, in their minds, since Jesus is the Messiah, he is to come to bring usher in an era of peace, but also to restore the kingdom of Israel. And Jesus basically says to them, don't worry about that. 
you have more important things to be concerned with. And then they focus on what Jesus said. They go to the upper room and they wait. Pentecost was one of three festivals in Israel that required all the men of Israel to come to Jerusalem with a grain offering. And Pentecost is also called the Feast of First Fruits. In Luke's account, he's combining these two. He's actually saying that first fruits is fulfilled with the coming of the Holy Spirit, because with the coming of the Holy Spirit, the first fruits of the grain offering of new believers is brought into the kingdom of God. Now, when the Spirit comes in Acts, they see split tongues, a fire on their head. And it was important for this visual because they needed to see that each one of them had a tongue of fire on their head so that they understood that there's not going to be a hierarchy here. The Holy Spirit isn't going to come on some versus others. The Holy Spirit is going to come on everyone. Then, of course, we have the dramatic sound of, let's say, a hurricane gale force wind. The sound of wind, but no wind. The people in Jerusalem hear this, and of course they're saying, what's going on? They may have thought initially, okay, wind, maybe we should stay indoors. It's going to whip up the sand. It's going to whip up the dirt in the streets. We're, we're not going out. But then they realized it's sound, not an actual wind. And so they come to see, well, what's going on? And about this time, the, dis the disciples come spilling out of the house, speaking in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. And as we know from the passage, they were dismissed as drunkards. And Peter gives that wonderful sermon in which he says, oh, no, 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 no. These men are not drunk as you suppose. But this is that that was promised by the prophet Joel. And he makes it clear that this is not a one-time event. This is a one-time event, the coming of the Holy Spirit. But that it's an enduring event that's going to keep coming as more people are brought into the kingdom by the Holy Spirit. And Peter says in his sermon that this promise which has been fulfilled from the prophecy of Joel is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. This is a dramatic very dramatic coming of the Holy Spirit, an event that could not possibly be missed. And it's important that that's the case because this is a public event because it is the ingathering of believers into the kingdom. I mean, this is not one of these things you want to do in a corner because who's going to know about it? Who's going to care? But it had to be a public event so that everyone understood what was going on. This is in contrast to the passage in John, which is a very private event. And unlike the Acts account, there's no wind, there's no fire, and it's private. The only people that know what's going on are the people that are gathered in the room when Jesus appears. That evening, and that evening, by the way, is the evening of the resurrection. The timing is so different. And let me just say this. Um, I'm going to enter in kind of Bible study mode here. The fact that the Spirit comes on the day of resurrection, Resurrection Sunday, Easter, versus coming on the day of Pentecost 
in Acts does not mean one is true and one is not. Because the Bible is written in a style with a cultural reference that is very different from ours. The Bible is not a Western book. Truth is not fact in the Bible, but that doesn't mean it's not truth. As I mentioned earlier, this is written for a specific group of people at a specific time. The point is that the Holy Spirit came. And actually, in John's account, the coming of the Holy Spirit is the ultimate focus of the farewell address that Jesus gives in Acts 14 through 17. Sometimes it's called the upper room discourse. I, I like calling it the farewell discourse because Jesus is preparing the disciples for his departure. He starts with, do not let your hearts be troubled, in John 14, 1. And then in John 20, 19, he says, peace, peace be with you. There is a literary concept called inclusio, where what is said in the beginning is repeated at the end. And what happens in the middle connects to both. Jesus is telling the disciples that he's going to go away. Now at first, he just says, you know, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that you can be where I am. But it begins to work in their minds, wait a minute, Jesus is going to be leaving. We've spent three years being taught, being nurtured, and now he's going away. But Jesus says, it's for your benefit that I go away. How can it be for my benefit? I've given up the work I was doing. I don't see my family as often as I used to. And now you're gonna leave just like that? But it's not just like that as we know because Jesus promises to send another comforter, described as the spirit of truth, who will lead the disciples in all that Jesus has told them. Now note he says another comforter. That implies there was a previous comforter, and that comforter was Jesus. Jesus loved them, nurtured them, directed them, and now he's leaving, but he's sending a replacement, if you will. How would anybody replace Jesus? You know, how, how, how do you replace someone who, who you've given up your life for? How do you replace someone who's unique in all of history? But Jesus promises them, you'll see, you'll see, I am sending you someone who will do not only what I've done, but he'll do things that I've not been able to do. Now that sounds funny though, to say Jesus not able to do something. We tend to focus a lot on Jesus' divinity and not enough on his humanity. Jesus was a human being with limitations like we have. We can't be in two places at once. Jesus couldn't be in two places at once. And even with his resurrection body that enabled him to suddenly appear, he still couldn't be in multiple places at one time. That's the difference with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be everywhere. When scripture says the earth will be filled with the glory of God, that's the Holy Spirit filling every place, being everywhere. He doesn't have to worry about traveling. He's everywhere. And he will be in the disciples and among the disciples. 
It's a both and. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as Luke outlined in, in Acts with the individual tongues, but the Spirit is also going to be among us because we need to work together, guided by the Holy Spirit, to do the work that we've been called to do. Hmm. I'm not following this anyway, so I might as well step away. Um, in John 14, 15, Jesus tells them that if you love me, you will obey my commandments. That is a critical piece when it comes to receiving the Holy Spirit. You've got to love Jesus. And that love has got to be demonstrated by obedience. How do you love someone without something that's demonstrable? You can say, I love you. And it doesn't mean a whole lot unless you do something that proves you love them. That is where obedience comes in. And Jesus says, then, then you will receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's ministry is a both and ministry. There's going to be witnessing involved. But the Holy Spirit is going to function as a comforter. The Holy Spirit is going to function as a guide. The Holy Spirit is going to teach the disciples and us the truth. Because Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. Just as Jesus told the disciples the truth that he heard from the Father, the Holy Spirit is going to tell the truth that he hears from the Father and the Son. And as I said before, Jesus was with the disciples among the disciples. But the Holy Spirit is going to do what Jesus couldn't do, indwell the disciples. So that for each of us individually and even collectively, he can speak God's truth to us. Hmm. Jesus promised the disciples he was not going to leave them orphaned. After an intense three years of ministry, Jesus is saying, I'm leaving, but I will not leave you orphaned. I will come to you. How are you going to come to us? It's through the Holy Spirit. It's through our being indwelt by the power of God. And can you imagine? God taking up residence in human beings. Because that's what happens. God takes up residence in us, sinful though we are, rebellious though we are, sometimes indifferent though we are, frightened as we sometimes are. God, the Holy Spirit, is going to take up residence in us. When Jesus promises the Holy Spirit, excuse me, when Jesus promises that the Father and the Son are going to come to the disciples. That's just another way of saying the Holy Spirit is going to indwell you. So, what's the advantage of having the Holy Spirit apart from being able to indwell us? If I forget what Jesus said and Jesus is not around, but I won't be able to forget, not if I allow the Holy Spirit to do the ministry he's come to do. You want me to witness, but I'm shy. The Holy Spirit will empower you. You know, it's easy for us as human beings because we're frail, because we're sinful. Thank God for Jesus. <laughs> and we sometimes allow our humanity 
and the limitations of our humanity to keep us from doing the things we need to do. I can't do this. You're right. You're absolutely right. You can't do it, not in your own strength. But the Holy Spirit in you can. Let me go back to Acts for a moment. You're accused of being drunk. People are ridiculing you. But because you have the Holy Spirit, you have boldness to say, oh no, we're not drunk. And Peter preaches a powerful sermon that adds 3,000 from one sermon. I can't think of a pastor or a preacher who wouldn't want that kind of effect, to have that kind of response. But that was the power of the Holy Spirit at work in Peter. That same spirit is in us. And that same spirit will give us the boldness, the power, the clarity of speech, and whatever else we need to do the work of God. As I mentioned, John's account of the coming of the Holy Spirit is a very private, very personal one. And it's the continuation of Jesus' farewell address in John 14 through 17. Jesus made a promise, and he kept it. And he says to his disciples, very, very simply, receive the Holy Spirit. It was really that simple, but equally powerful in a very quiet way. In the Elijah passage, God is tearing up stones, bringing down fire, but God wasn't in it. And when Elijah heard that still small voice, that's when he knew it was time to meet the Lord. And the same thing applies here. In the quietness of that room with a group of disciples who are terrified because just a few days ago, Jesus was put to death. In spite of Mary telling them, I've seen the Lord and this is what he's told me. In spite of what Jesus had said to them to comfort them in preparation for his crucifixion, fear overcame them. But when Jesus came, that fear vanished because they knew they weren't seeing a ghost because he showed them his hands and his side. A ghost may walk through walls, but a ghost doesn't have nail prints. It is I. I am here. I have risen. And now, I'm going to do for you what I have promised. Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, whether Jesus, whether the Holy Spirit comes with a noisy sound of a wind, whether the Holy Spirit comes with tongues of fire, whether the Holy Spirit comes with speaking in other languages, or he comes, he came. And because he came, we're gathered together. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. The Holy Spirit is doing the work that Jesus sent him to do. And we all have power to do the work he called us to do. Thanks be to God.